I have spent a lot of time over the past few months investigating and testing virtual working environments. I really think this is the future. I think that in a few years we will look back at images of traffic jams and crowded subways and ask, why did so many people have to travel all that way every day just to do what they could have done at home? Granted, not every job fits this category. Healthcare workers need to go to a hospital to practice much of their craft, as do chefs and bus drivers going to their locations. But the majority of people who commuted on a daily basis prior to the pandemic did so to get to a place where their work was. But now it appears much of that can be done anywhere. Welcome to Cool Time Life. I'm Steve Prentice. Each of my Cool Time Life podcasts focuses on a topic dealing with people, productivity and technology and life, and each offers ideas and facts you might need to know about to thrive in today's busy world. An index of our podcasts is available at steveprentice.com under the podcast link. The key pushback I hear about the whole work-from-home thing is that it takes away the spontaneity and togetherness of the office workplace. People being together under one roof provides a tribal comfort, even if you don't necessarily like all those people who are there. The fact that they are there touches us in an instinctive way. Those who think that it's not possible to be together virtually have good reason for doubting it. They haven't seen anything that replaces what they perceive as the reality of the office space. That's an outlook that is very typical of human beings. We tend to judge everything by what we have known in the past and not what is potential in the future. Imagine, for example, if we were living 100 years ago and someone handed you a device you had never seen or heard of before called a telephone. How could it be possible, you ask, for a person to be crammed inside the wire of this device? And what good would it do? People need to be together in a room in order to get things done. You can say the same thing about any technological development, really. The car, the television, the internet, every one of these and more were greeted with a collective, so what? It can't be better than what we have already. It takes a few years for any technology to truly grow into its own. That's what I think we're seeing with virtual office spaces. People cannot grasp the idea that an office space can be an always-on zone where colleagues can coexist casually and talk to each other whenever they want. That's because up until now, most of the technology that we use has a degree of formality to it. A Zoom call, for example, has mostly been used for scheduled meetings. Emails, too, are formal communications. They're like old-fashioned letters, really, placed in envelopes and delivered to the recipient. Even text messaging and messaging apps like WhatsApp, they're pretty formal, even though they start to edge towards casual in their multi-person group conversational style. Slack has moved the needle a bit more to the area of spontaneous collaboration, but it and Microsoft Teams too have been something of a hard sell when people can't see enough of a difference between messaging and email. There's another wall of reluctance too when people are shown images of bulky VR headsets. The idea of moving into a virtual world with headsets and with colleagues appearing as avatars seems just kind of too weird. I'm convinced, though, that this is typically the negative reaction to change that most humans show towards pretty much anything. It's new, and it doesn't make sense. But, again, just like the telephone, the same could have been said about black and white photographs. You know, that doesn't look like a person. People aren't monochrome, could be the pushback. And the same could be said about color photographs or even TV and Instagram. That's not a person. They're too small and two-dimensional. Our mind tends to work to interpret what we see and accept it as a version of reality, and we've done this since the very first cave painting was made to represent an animal and the very first sentence was spoken to describe a person. The mind is still very good at filling in the gaps. I am therefore convinced that in a couple of years the virtual office space will become the new normal, and a trip to the physical office will be just a special event. It's not that humans don't need to be together, it's just that they don't need to be in the same space anymore to be together. My favorite virtual space right now is called Cozy, K-O-S-Y, and I think they're onto something really good here. The product, which can be found at CozyOffice.com, that's again K-O-S-Y Office.com, combines the preferred reality of people's real faces and voices delivered by our own computer's camera and microphone with an office layout, including the spaces we are comfortable with, like breakout rooms, cubicles, and a kitchenette. The idea here is that while you work from your home office space, you can place your avatar in a cubicle or in any of the rooms they offer. The key value is that others in your team can also place themselves in this space, and if you see someone you want to talk to, you simply guide your avatar across to the zone that they occupy, at which point the mic becomes live and the conversation can start. 
Of course, the app offers the other collaboration tools like whiteboard tools, messaging and document sharing. But overall, it adds a sense of presence that is real enough to feel comfortable without being surreal enough to feel like you're in a video game. I've posted a link to the text version of this episode, which is on LinkedIn Pulse, and which contains a screen grab of me hanging out in my cozy office. There's also a link in the show notes to this podcast episode. Another great app that follows the same presence approach is Toucan, and that's available at toucan.events, T-O-U-C-A-N dot events. This offers a service called Toucan Space, and it too is designed to be a place where people are, in the sense that they exist, rather than simply logging on for a scheduled meeting. Everyone's avatar is also a real video of you through your camera, and it's visible in the space, and to activate a conversation, you simply move your avatar close to somebody, or go to a table and have others also sit at that table. So note that these technologies are not Zoom meetings. They are places to be throughout the day, being visible to your team while your team remains visible to you, even if you don't interact. Some of the resistance that I have heard comes from the notion that it is difficult to have a conversation with an avatar. For a starter, it is very hard to take avatars seriously for many people. And secondly, there's the issue of body language. So let's look at both of those. An avatar is generally a cartoon-style replica of yourself, and that is indeed insufficient to engage fully in human conversation. It feels strange to people who have grown up interacting with other humans face-to-face. Yet everyone does seem perfectly comfortable talking to a disembodied voice on the phone and relating to others by way of bubbles of text on a chat app. I think it's also about what people accept as a valid representative of a person or the people they are talking to. It's a kind of a mental transition that is on par with wading into the ocean. The first few minutes feel strange and uncomfortable until your body acclimatizes to its new surroundings. So avatars basically just require some time to get used to, at which point they will become the person that you are relating to. There's also, of course, the issue of body language, and that's where I think a big change is going to happen in virtual presence in the next couple of years. During the pandemic, when most people learned about video chat for the first time, they did one of two things. They either turned their camera off or they sat too close. Turning the camera off is typical for people who are uncomfortable seeing themselves on camera. This again is similar to the reactions people have when they hear their recorded voice for the first time. Do I really sound like that, they say? They don't necessarily like seeing themselves on live camera, which they consider to be very different from the more controllable world of social media selfies. And there is indeed a heightened degree of cognitive overload that comes from seeing yourself in real time. So people turn the camera off. And when everyone does that, it simply becomes a conference call. There's also the bandwidth reason as well, of course, that video does take up a lot of processing power on computers and requires a reliable Ethernet connection to work. This is a legitimate technical reason for turning off a camera, but I want to stick to the emotional and social ones for the time being. So if people don't turn the camera off, the other reaction is to sit too close. This again is a response based perhaps on the human desire to focus in on the face as a primary object of attention during a conversation, or maybe it's just how you have seen people on TV. It's the head and shoulders passport photo approach. It might also have a lot to do with desk space, given that many people use the camera mounted on their laptop computer, but it doesn't take much to push back a little to allow other participants to see your arms and your hands. When people start doing this, I think it'll make a major difference. Because this is how, after all, people perceive you in a face-to-face conversation. They rely on facial gestures, but they're also very in tune with body language as a method of conveying the full story. Many people do this already, but from the hundreds of video chats that I have been on or I have seen, I would suggest that most people focus way too much still on keeping their face solely in the frame. I think that a great many people will grow comfortable with the virtual office very soon. Logging on and sitting their avatar down at their desk in their office and looking around to see who else is in today, that's a very natural thing to do. So even if you're working at your home office with your computer on your desk, to have this presence in the background is comforting and it's normal. If a spontaneous meeting needs to be held, it can be just as easy to tap on the virtual shoulders of a colleague and march on down to the virtual meeting space and have that meeting. I think this will help alleviate Zoom gloom, which is that concept I've referred to in a previous podcast, which refers to the sense of isolation that people feel when a video chat meeting comes to an end. Because when video chat technology was used just for meetings, which are formalized events, its conclusion, where everyone waves goodbye and searches for their leave meeting button, tended to magnify the sense of isolation felt by almost everybody, but especially by those who are unused to working from home. So being able instead to physically move one's avatar out of the meeting space and back to their desk, I think is going to eliminate this sense of isolation and termination. 
As a last point, there was a significant event that happened in the summer of 2021, which you may or may not have noticed. It was called the Great Resignation. And this was a spike in the number of people quitting their jobs out of economic necessity or simply the realization that the job as a whole package, including the commute and its associated costs, made it all simply not worth it. Perhaps for some it had to do with the added pressures of the COVID pandemic, especially with kids being homeschooled. But when a significant number of people leave their jobs simultaneously, you have to ask, what about the job made it that unbearable? For many, it's not the job per se, but the circumstances and the working conditions. There are a lot of talented and valuable people in this group who continue to resign en masse, people who know their jobs and could do so much of it from a home office where they can blend their work and family responsibilities into a far more pragmatic continuum. I find it very sad when organizations push back against the idea of working from home simply because managers can't see if their employees are actually working or not. I think these virtual, always-on office setups like Cozy Office and Toucan Dot events might really help to bring both sides closer together. That would be a nice new normal. So, there you have it, my little podcast on the unbearable lightness of being virtual. If you have a comment about this podcast or a question you'd like answered in a future episode, please do let me know. You can drop me a line through the contact form at steveprentice.com, where you can also find my links to Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. A full listing of the past episodes is available at steveprentice.com under the podcast link. I do try to keep the episodes evergreen so that the concepts do not get dated too quickly. So check them out and download whichever one feels good. Oh, and some news. I have a new book coming out this year in 2022 all about how the reflex of fear may stand in the way of your company's digital transformation. For more information about that and to pre-order the book, you can visit futureoffear.com. Until next time, I'm Steve Prentice. Stay safe and thanks for listening.